Brad, thank you so much for coming on the AIM podcast. Well, I'm glad you could have me on here. So, I think the only thing that would make this better is if we were able to share a cookie uh, together right now, which I need to get one soon. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, nine in the morning and I've already had cookies. So I was downstairs <laughs> this morning and they were mixing some dough and uh, you guys sample what they're making, make sure everything tastes good. I was, yeah, it's interesting you say that because I was actually going to ask you, like, how often do you eat cookies and like when do you mix them into your day? Like, how does that work in your routine? Yeah, I find that on <laughs> days that I'm like not being consistent with my food, like I haven't had breakfast yet or like I'm not having lunch or something and I'm down in the kitchen, I tend to eat more cookies <laughs> than I should. Um, I would say on average, I probably eat like two cookies a week. So it's more like it's not right. like I sit down and have like a whole cookie. It's usually like, you know, breaking open a cookie, like, you know, have a quarter of a cookie there or, you know, in passing, like have a bite of a cookie. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, but I guess it's if you ask people that worked at like a pizza shop, how much they ate pizza at first, they'd probably say they ate a lot. But then after a while, you're like, so used to it being around that it's you don't have that scarcity mindset. So it's like, right whenever it's available all the time so you can have it whenever you want so you don't feel the need to get it just because you're like i don't know when the next time i'll get this is so. <laughs> now that makes a lot of sense and it, it also makes sense what you said about you know t tasting new flavors or new cookies you guys are making you obviously need to have a hand in that so that totally yeah. makes sense too <laughs> well cool man well listen I'm, I'm super pumped first off thank you for your service we've been fortunate to have on several guests that have served and i always want to just kind of preface the episode with you know you making that sacrifice to protect us and, and allow us that freedom to even do this podcast. So thank you for what you did there. And I'm excited to just talk about all the experiences you've had in your life from serving to now business and being a father. I think it's going to be a fun episode. Yeah. I, I, my mustache right now definitely looks like I've served in the military. This is like a, on the submarines, definitely. Well, you're allowed to grow facial hair on submarines, believe it or not. So like you can have a full on beard. Um, and then anytime we were pulling into ports or, or we were pulling in uh, to change over the crew we had to shave but everyone would usually just shave off everything but their mustache so I, I definitely fit the navy submarine look right now i love it yeah i was about to say i think top gun definitely kind of fueled that fire as well the top gun mustaches everyone was rocking well, and, and yeah people don't know but like you know top guns navy as well so those those pilots are not air force they're navy because they're on the uh aircraft carriers so um then the navy pilot navy community definitely embraces mustaches so I honestly, dude, I would rock it if I could. I don't really have that gene right now, but maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. Let's go, man. Well, listen, I, you know, for those that are listening, that are tuning in, that maybe don't know your, your full background, I obviously want to touch on a lot of the business things that you guys are doing now, but for the context, could you share a little bit more about how you kind of got into the Navy um, and all the things you did leading up to making that full-time transition to business? Yeah, so um, I graduated from the University of Florida with my electrical engineering degree in 2009. Um, there was a program that the Navy was offering something called NUPOC. It's a nuclear propulsion officer candidate program. But essentially, you joined while you were still in college, and then you would then you know, be commissioned into the, or go through OCS and be commissioned in the Navy, like when you finish. So I actually joined the program in like late 2007. Uh, a lot of my friends were like, I'm um, staying in college. The economy, if people don't remember, it's like 07, 08, like you knew that it was like, the economy was kind of like tanking, if you will, uh, kind of the similar situation that we feel right now. Um, so I knew that was gonna be really hard to get an engineering job. And so I was like, hey, the military is always hiring. So I joined this NUPOC program and then, uh, you know, went through the nuclear power school, uh, went through dive school and then went, uh, was stationed outside of Seattle, Washington on the USS Ohio. And I did um, five and a half years in the Navy, met my wife my last three months that I was stationed in, uh, in Seattle and uh, got a job opportunity um, at BASF Chemicals in Houston, Texas when I was getting out of the military. My now wife decided to move with me. We were just dating for three months at a time, um, but obviously it all worked out. But when we were in Houston, there was a huge culture of fitness. Uh, we were being asked all the time because my wife is very fit. She's actually the more popular one. I joke that I'm only popular by like trickle down effect from her. Um, <laughs> But she, um, people were asking us all the time, like, you, you, you both uh, look really good and you eat sweets. Like, how do you do this? Like, how do you, you know, what's your, so that's when we started, I guess, the fitness social media stuff where we started our YouTube channel and where we started sharing on Instagram, like our workouts, like what we eat in a day and, and stuff like that. And um, obviously Houston being the 
I don't, I don't know. It's like kind of like a little mecca of bodybuilding yeah. with Christian and is there and, and you have Heidi Buff Bunny and, and you have Russ Wall and then, you know, Sholly and uh, all those people are there. And then, you know, not too far away, you have Nick Bear in Austin and right. things like that. So that's how, how it all kind of started for us. And, and over the three year period we lived in Houston, we kind of just grew our social media following to the point where we were doing our full-time jobs and working on social media and we didn't really have a life outside of those two things and i eventually looked at my wife and i was like hey we can't keep doing both like we're gonna have to either quit doing social media as much or we're gonna have to quit our full-time jobs and like fully go into social media so we decided to quit our full-time jobs and fully go into social media and we launched fat and weird cookie at the same time that we quit our jobs and we thought that was just gonna be like a little side gig make some extra <laughs> income and uh, it, it ended up being the main gig. Uh, and now we're in a, you know, 10,000 square foot facility and we live above it. And we've been slinging cookies for like four and a half years now. So that's amazing, dude. That's such a cool story, man. I love to see the kind of the transition and the different steps. And honestly, even some of the risks you guys took, um, which I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit later. That's kind of a big theme for most entrepreneurs to some degree. But you have this, I just you know, in the in the short time I've gotten to know you, I've I've experienced it. And obviously listening to other interviews you've done, you have a very strong sense of execution in the way you live. And I'm curious to know, like, where did that come from for you specifically? Is that something you think you brought from the military? Or is that something you've kind of always had in your life? Because obviously, that's a huge characteristic and a huge thing that you have to have in order to succeed in business and in life. Yeah. So, I mean, I was fortunate that my parents are entrepreneurs as well. Um, my parents own a wholesale janitorial supply company, but they started that like th literally, I think two months after I was born. So I got to like watch as I grew, like the struggles that come with that. You know, a lot of people nowadays on social media, you just see a company and you see it growing and you're like, wow, that company is killing it. Like they're, they're great. But I got to see like the real behind the scenes of a, of a company starting out. I got to see my parents, you know, choosing to invest into the company and then not investing into our utility bill for the month and our power would get shut off, um, you know, because there was a small business and they were trying to, I mean, they were literally all in on the small business. So everything was getting put back into the company. Um, and you know now they have a very successful company. It's it's do, does really well. But when I was younger, I got to watch that struggles. I got to to see what it was like for you know my parents to pour everything back into the company to the point where sometimes that meant our you know like I said our power got shut off. We we would play these. Um, board games by candlelight. Uh, and I thought it was like a fun bonding thing my parents wanted to do, but it was because no, we couldn't afford our electricity bill. So our electricity got cut off. Um, so it was never for long periods of time. It was like a couple of days. And usually my grandparents would like come help them financially so that they could get the power turned back on. But I really got to see what it was like for someone to like believe in something so much that they were going to do what it took to make that company succeed. And I, I think that's kind of the same philosophy that I have with fat and weird, you know, Aubrey and I don't, don't pay ourselves. We don't buy lavish things. We invested everything back into the company, which is why we have this, you know, big facility that's ours that we're not renting space in and things like that is because we know the potential of what fat and weird could be. So we've invested all that money back into the company um, because we believe in the, in the long term, it's going to be so much bigger. So yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's true for, for many entrepreneurs. I think if you can find some way to gain that exposure and, and kind of see it and live it, and honestly, it sounds like you lived it. So you were able to really be, you know, kind of in the mix of it. How important is that, do you think, for young entrepreneurs trying to get into business to have some form of exposure or mentorship? It sounds like your parents in a way were obviously, you know, loving you as as your their, you were their child, but at the same time, it sounds like you maybe gained some mentorship from them or just, you know, experience through living with them. Yeah. Um, I, well, I guess mentorship, I think is important, but I think a lot of times people rely too much on other people's opinions that don't have a fight and like they don't have a dog in the fight. Right. So like a lot of people can kind of tell me the best way to run fat and weird, but if they're not in it every day, they don't know all the intricate ins and outs of it and you know it's almost like gambling with house money right i can go tell you what to do all the time with things but it's like not you that's affected by a wrong decision so it's a lot easier to tell someone what they should or shouldn't do 
uh, when you're not going to have to live with the repercussions of that decision. But that being said, there are, there are a lot of people that have really great ideas. And I think what you need to do is just take people's opinions and recommendations, see where, you know, maybe your ideas could use some of their ideas and blend them together, or, or maybe they have a better idea in general. Um, but I think a lot of times you have to, you know, at the end, you're going to have to make the call what's best for your business, because they're not going to live with the repercussions of whatever decision you decide to make, that's all going to be on you. So yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And I feel like obviously, it's it's important to maybe have those conversations, gain that insight from others that have maybe had that experience or done it, but at the end of the day, to your point, you're really not going to truly learn or truly grow until you get in the fire and actually fight a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of things in in business and life that you're going to think is a negative. Um, and in the moment, it may feel like a really bad thing has happened. But sometimes uh, a week, a year later, you look back and that what happened there was like exactly what needed to happen to bring you to where you are now. So, you know, sometimes a door closes and you're like, oh, this is it. Like my, my business is ruined. Like I, this was what I was counting on. And then, uh, you know, two weeks later, another opportunity opens up that if you would have been able to go through that first door, you wouldn't have been able to go through this door that's open now. And this new door is even better than what you could have imagined. So, you know, um, I think that a lot of things in life are what you make of them, right? Nothing's good unless you say it's so. Nothing's bad unless you say it's so. So it's all perspective on those things. But, you know, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. It has its highs and it has its lows. And you just got to be along for the ride sometimes. Yeah, I love how you say that. I think that's really powerful. What, um, where did this idea come from? And, and I'd love to know more about like, how did you guys even come up with the name of Fat and Weird Cookie? That's such an interesting creative name because I feel like most people... And again, I would love to hear your strategy here because I know you'll also have a business about memories and macros and you're kind of preaching the importance of balance. So you're not necessarily going all in on this idea of making it like a really healthy cookie. But most people created companies in this world where they're trying to emphasize the health elements of their product. So like, how did you guys come up with this branding and this this idea? Yeah, so April of 2018 for my birthday, um, Aubrey, which is my wife, de decided that she wanted to surprise me with like cookies to our P.O. box that we had in Houston. So she just asked her followers at the time, like, hey, you know, if you would just send cookies to our P.O. box for Brad for his birthday, <laughs> like that he would love that and it'd be really great. Well, we had an insane outpouring of cookies sent to our house and wow. some of them were homemade. Some of them were from, you know, bakeries like Levain Bakery, which is a really famous bakery in New York. Um, and then other gourmet cookie uh, places all around um, the U S and then we even had cookies come from like Japan and Austria, like the military following that I had, uh, Canada, things wow. like that. And, um, we sat down and we just like started trying all these different cookies. And I felt like there was like a really niche market missing, um, at that time. Cause you gotta remember this was like coming up on five years ago of people that did gourmet cookies that were big, like the New York style cookies, like you have at, at Levain, but instead of a Snickers cookie being just like a chopped up Snickers bar into like what would be a chocolate chip cookie dough, you know, um, that it was like an actual Snickers cookie where it was like a chocolate cookie with peanut butter chips and peanuts in it. And it was filled with like a caramel. So that way, instead of like it being, I'm going to chop up some item and put it in a cookie and call it a Snickers cookie, I'm going to reimagine a Snickers as if it were a cookie. And that's kind of the idea that I came up with. And then we, you know, kind of just embrace that. And then for the name, uh, my wife and I, whenever we'd go on cruises, we would joke before we were going to the buffets and stuff, it's time to get fat and weird. And it just <laughs> felt, felt like it really fit with our cookie name because it's something that we had already said before. Um, so that's kind of where fat and weird uh, came about, fat cookies with weird names. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if this sounds like cocky or not, but I'm pretty sure we pioneered the like crazy names of cookies. Like if you see a cookie company out there now, because there's a lot of them now, right? Um, yeah. That have these like funny names for cookies. Granted, or, I mean, they're probably following me or Aubrey or Fat and Weird or have some kind of influence from us. Um, so I, I like to say I, we pioneered this like kind of gourmet artesian um, stuffed cookie world with these like funny names. So that's an amazing story. And honestly, uh, you can tell you guys are both very, I'm sure skilled in a lot of ways, but you definitely enhance in the marketing world. Like you guys, y'all's marketing, your packaging, the way you promote stuff, the events, you got, like all that stuff is really, really cool. That's, that's kind of funny. That's the way it came about though. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, like I said, I thought it was just going to be this thing where we'd probably sell like a couple hundred cookies a week. And it would be like this one day we'd go in the kitchen and bake them. The next day we'd ship them out. Uh, and then obviously it grew and grew and grew. And then, you know, COVID uh, 2020 was kind of like the epitome of the growth stage. And it was just really insane demand. Um, like we, we couldn't keep up. We were selling out on the website in a matter of minutes for the whole week. Um, that was probably the craziest time for fat and weird, um, as far as like demand goes. And then now we're just going through like a new issue, which is, you know, we're working with wholesalers. So, you know, Publix is coming next month to meet with us. Um, wow. and no, and we've had meetings with, uh, other major grocery outlets like HEB and Whole Foods and things like that. So that's the next step for Fat and Weird is is going into this wholesale route. So that's exciting, man. I'm I'm curious. Did your shift, like, did your mindset shift from an increased demand or an increased desire to go at this thing and really attack it? Because you said when it started, it was more of like, let's just do this kind of for fun. Let's bring in some extra revenue. We enjoy it. But like what truly kind of tipped that edge to make you go in full time? Well, I mean, I think that when the demand's there, it's easy to jump in. Right. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, you were talking about risk being an entrepreneur, like truthfully starting fat and weird was not that big of a risk. The financial, um, piece that we had to put in was like pretty low, you know, because I mean, there was a kitchen facility here in Panama City, that's a commercial kitchen that you could rent space in just hourly rent space in um, the first round of ingredients because it was only a couple hundred cookies wasn't that expensive. Throwing up a website, you know, is like not that expensive. We all know. So like, I think the total investment for fat and weird was like $2,000, which like, I'm wow. not going to scoff at $2,000. But like to start a clothing company, you're talking way more money to start most businesses you're talking considerably more money than two thousand dollars so fat and weird was really started with two thousand dollars um so yeah that's that's still like not a amount of money that you know most people could easily just like throw away but it's not a huge investment comparatively to another other businesses to start and so the risk wasn't really that big, in my opinion, to start fat and weird, where the risk gets big is doing what we've done now is building the building, right? You're investing, you know, millions of dollars back into the company to build a building instead of, you know, cashing out and walking away, you know, so um, that's where it, it is, I guess, riskier. And two, when the demand is like it is like, why not keep growing? People are buying them, like keep trying to offer more and more and more. Um, and so, you know, we, we got into a really um, fortunate time to start a business with COVID and everything that we were able to have that crazy online demand and, and build the facility that we're in now and own it completely outright. And now it's just like expanding into the other avenues like wholesale and things like that. So. Yeah, it's exciting, man. That's really cool to see what you guys have built and obviously where the, where the brand is headed. I'm curious. I think most entrepreneurs that we've had on the show can talk about this to some degree. I'm curious what y'all's, um, you know, y'all's experience was like, but in the early stages of getting this company going, you talk about, you know, demand was picking up, things were coming in and it was kind of just moving in the right direction. But were there any particular challenges or lessons that you learned in the early stages that you can identify as things that you really needed to understand now that you're able to kind of get through them and get past them? Yeah, I mean, I, too many to even count, truthfully, you know, when you're, when you're in that stage, you're just like trying to survive is really yeah. your thing. It's like, you know, I mean, people were leaving us like angry messages that we were selling out so fast. So like, you're like trying to increase demand. Um, you know, I was like buying more freezer and fridge space to like carry more products. I, I, I was doing anything I could to try to like increase demand in the moment. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's all it, like literally, I know it's going to sound stupid. It's all like a blur. Like so much stuff happened in such a short period of time that it, it just seems like a blur to me. Um, what um, I guess my advice would be is just like, if you can bring on more people to help you, you can get a lot more done if you have help, um, people that you can rely on. Um, Sometimes that's friends. Uh, sometimes I tell you to avoid bringing friends into your business because uh, it can just make your relationship be a little bit difficult with them because it's hard to have like friendship boundaries and work boundaries. Uh, so, um, you know, I know like Nick has his brother working for him. That would probably be a good question to talk about that relationship and the, yeah. that goes in that. But, you know, friends can be difficult because it, obviously you trust them and, the, you know, 
you know what they're capable of doing. So it's easy to like rely on them. But I've found that, you know, a lot of times it's better to just hire people you don't know uh, to work for you just because there's that respect and uh, it's a little bit more clear cut on what the expectations of the relationship are. Um, so I would say bring in help. If you can get help, that would be, um, the main thing I would say is because a lot of times you'll get so bogged down in certain things that the businesses will start bottlenecking around you. And so if you can get help, then you can alleviate some of those issues. And then you can actually do your job as the entrepreneur slash CEO to, to kind of like, push through the areas that you need to push through and have other people, you know, do what they need to do. So. Yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's, that's an interesting element of business that um, I think it, it takes skill. I think it also takes a degree of leadership, obviously, to be able to bring people on and to then manage and lead them. What does that process look like for you guys? I, you, I, in an interview I listened to prepping for this podcast, I heard you talk about bringing on your first full-time employee and, in the early stages, you're like, I don't even know what we're going to do each day, just kind of picking different things, making boxes, whatever. But how has that kind of transformed and grown through your process of being an entrepreneur and now a leader with t- bringing in people to the company? Yeah, I mean, I, at first, I think when you hire people, you have to hire like jack of all trades, like people when they when they're working for a startup business, like they should know or you should let it be known that this is kind of one of those things where hey, this is the business that we're doing. And you're probably going to have to do a little bit of everything to start out, you know, like when you're starting out your company, you don't have like a, a you know, a marketing person, you don't have a uh, financial person, you don't have, you know, an operations person, you are all those things, or you hired people to like do multiple different things. And so I think that that's part of it is just setting the expectations. Um, I know when we interview people, the majority of the time I like the person already from their resume. So really when I'm interviewing them, I'm trying to make sure that they feel like they're a good fit for us because if I, from their resume and talking to them, you know, briefly in the very beginning, feel like they're that I like them. The next step is I want to make sure that they like us because that's how you have like a good relationship, right? You can, uh, you don't want a one side relationship where they're they're like, yeah, I'm here. I'm at work every day, but <laughs> they don't enjoy it. Right. So literally, you know, on our interviews here, we like tour people around the facility. We talk about the day to day. I want people to know exactly what they're getting into. So that way they're not, I guess, blindsided or or feel like this isn't what they signed up for. So I, I think that that's part of any kind of team that you build is just like managing expectations and making sure that people understand like what needs to be done. Um, I read a really good book on leadership and it's called Turn That Ship Around. I liked it because it's about submarines and I actually <laughs> felt like I could understand a lot more what was going on, but it's a great leadership book because it kind of talks about the nuclear Navy, which is, you know, all submarines are nuclear powered. There's a lot of degree of scrutiny and... Um, oversight that comes into that that because i mean there's a nuclear reactor on board a submarine right it's like most people are scared of nuclear reactors on land and then you put it in a in a boat and then you submerge that boat underwater people are even more scared of this submarine or of the nuclear reactor so the a lot of submarine captains since they're in charge are very top-down leadership which means like they are micromanaging, you know, to say the least, but turn that ship around was about a captain that came on board that really empowered the people below him to run their divisions. And then part of that is just keeping him updated of things or letting him know their intentions. And I think that's my leadership style. Uh, a lot of people, um, are kind of caught off guard at first that I don't like walk in and be like, do this, do this, do this. I'm, I'm like, yep, this is what needs to get done today. And then I'm kind of like, how do you plan on doing it? And like, yeah. I don't, I don't really want you, I don't want to tell you how to do it because you may come up with a better idea than I would have come up with how you do it. So my leadership style is a lot like, Hey, these are the things that need to get done. And I just like to be briefed on like how you plan to do that. And I'm not going to come up with how it, how you should do it. Um, I may like throw in, Hey, you may want to consider this if I feel like there's some ideas that could help. Um, but in general, I leave it up to the people in charge of whatever they're doing to do it the best way they see fit. And I just like to be briefed on how they do it. So that way I can make sure that there's no, um, 
I guess, miscommunication or, or something that's going to occur between the teams. For example, if we have a really big shipping day, sometimes some of our production employees go into the shipping room. So if I came into the shipping room and I said, hey, how do you plan on doing this today? And she's like, oh, I'm going to take two people from production to help ship orders. And I went into production and said, hey, how do you plan on doing this today? And they're like, oh, all everyone's going to be doing this today. Then I could be like, hey, well, you need you two need to talk because that's not going to work, you know? Um, but in general, I like just like, let everyone lead the divisions that they're supposed to be in charge of. And then I make sure that it's all gelling. So that's so good. I need to read that book. That sounds like a really good book. Yeah. It's, it's really great. Audible, you know, listen to it while I was working out. So that's great. Yeah. It's cool. I think there's a, obviously there's a lot of important characteristics that go into a good leader. I think obviously you see a lot of really cool characteristics come from guys in the military that are able to talk about their experiences. Jocko obviously talks about like taking ownership of your team but I think with you, to your point, too, and I think they can go hand in hand, but also finding ways to really empower the people working for you to be creative and to bring their own value to you. And at the end of the day, if you can hire on people that are better than you at certain things, like that was one thing that Nick talked about was, you know, bringing on someone to really crush finance or brings like places where he maybe knew enough because he educated himself, but wasn't an expert. It's like when you bring those people in, your team gets so much better, but obviously you have to be pulling in the same direction. And that ultimately is where you would take that ownership. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think even with the leadership that we're talking about with that turn that ship, turn that ship around book is there's still an ownership piece of it. At the end of the day, like the captain of the submarine or whoever is still going to be liable or in charge of like whatever happens. Um, and it's easy to go like, well, you didn't do your job right. But the truth is like, you didn't empower them. You didn't educate them. You didn't set boundaries for them. So it, it all really does fall back on you. In fact, it, pretty much everything in your life, you can go back and some way, shape or form, put it on you. Maybe there's some things completely out of your control. Like if a tornado came through your neighborhood and tore your house up, like you can't be like, well, this was my fault. But at the end of the day, there, there are a majority of things in your life, uh, car accidents, even when they're not your fault, that maybe you could have avoided that car accident. Um, you can take ownership for a lot of things in life. And when you take ownership of it, the beautiful thing about that is I know a lot of people are like, why would I want to take ownership of it? You can't do anything if you can't take ownership of it. So what Fact. you're what you're saying when you can't take ownership of it is life is happening to me. I'm not directing my life at all. So by taking ownership of it, you can say like I can change the outcome of these things. Otherwise, you're just a victim. And uh I don't want to be a victim. So I love that, dude. That's that was a big part of the reason I started this podcast and this platform of just talking about the power of ambition. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of things that are going to happen in your life that are unfortunate. There's a lot of things that are going to happen that you can't control, but you can control the way you respond to them. You can control the way you wake up and approach the day. You can control the way that you help other people and go out of your way to just be grateful and have perspective. Like you were saying with certain things, it's like, those are things we can control. And that's, man, that got me excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's again, when I was talking about my growing up, like my parents, we were, you know, without, uh, I guess a lot of money and believe it or not, I don't remember how long ago this was, but McDonald's used to do 10 cent cheeseburgers, like a special. It was only like once every <laughs> so often, but they would like do the rollback prices and it would be like 10 cent cheeseburgers. And the limit was 10 per customer. And my mom would go through the drive through and get 10. And then she'd send us inside me and my sister to get another 10 and then wow. she'd freeze them. And that would be like our meal for like <laughs> days would be just, mcdonald's cheeseburgers that were frozen that you would like reheat in the oven um and looking back about that like i like laugh at it now because it was just like it was a fun thing for us you know but in the moment i'm sure my mom was like stressed and anxious and thinking about like how terrible this was that she was having to do that but i actually look back on those memories and i like laugh at them and i think like the board game nights with my family was like fun we used to play battleship and like i enjoyed that time and i know that in the moment, my parents were probably so stressed and so anxious and felt like such failures, but they created some of the most fun memories that I have as a child going back and, and those things that we did together, um, you know, the vacations to my grandparents' house because <laughs> like we needed to go there to stay for, you know, for power or or just because my parents like didn't really have enough money for for food. So we'd be eating at the grandparents' house. 
like those are fond memories for me. And so like, I think all of that again is perspective, right? In the moment, my parents would probably tell you like, this is the lowest lows for them. But for us, it was great. And I think if they knew that now, they wouldn't have been so worried about it. So I love that. Dude. I think that's a really cool perspective. And, you know, when you talk about early in the episode, like as an entrepreneur, you're going to experience highs and you're going to experience lows. And these are two things that are going to happen. And I think as long as you maintain that belief and as long as you know you're fulfilled by a purpose, a drive that you're doing something that's going to, you know, help people and pay off and ultimately go in the direction you're headed, those lows can be okay. Like you're going to learn from them. You're going to, you know, experience them. But to your point, like if you can enjoy them and just be grateful for that experience, knowing that it's going to continue, it's going to pay off that sacrifice, that, that pain, that low is going to pay off. I think that's where people can become really powerful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and it's in, like I said before, sometimes you feel like you're in a low and you may look back and be like, that was actually a high and I just didn't realize it, you know? So that's good, man. That's really good. I'm curious. You guys have obviously, you know, built a really strong brand. It's cool to see like on social, you guys are doing great. Obviously you're activating, you've done a really cool um, in-person event with cookie fest, which I want to touch on in a second, but, and that might be the answer to this question, but are there any like kind of just outlying, you know, enjoyable moments or fulfilling moments that you've had during the growth of this business so far that you really just kind of associate with and are excited and grateful for? Yeah, I mean, we, um, I mean, we went on a TV show, Pickler and Ben, because of our cookies back in like March of 2019. I think that was a lot of fun opportunity from this. Um, I've, you know, because of our cookie company, like I've talk to Hershey's, you know, I've talked to their product development team. That's a really cool, you know, thing that we've done. And then obviously now like reaching out to people like Publix and HEB and the buyers are interested and want to come to our facility and talk to us about a relationship because they know about our brand. I think that's a really cool thing. Um, and, and I think it's always just really cool to be like recognized outside of here or even in, in Panama City, I was I was going to Publix the other day, uh, late at night to get uh, milk for Letty <laughs> and uh, was walking down the aisle and uh, a girl was passing by and she's like, hey, how are you? And then she like double taked and she's like, oh my God, you're Brad. And I just like laughed <laughs> and we, we talked for a second, but like things like that are, are really cool um, to for people to recognize you out in person and, and talk to you and, and to hear that you've made an impact on someone's life for the better, uh, whether it's, you know, through working out or or, or some kind of mental, um, you know, belief that they have that you've helped them with, um, or you've helped them through a, a rough time just by posting, you know, our videos of me and Letty. Um, and then the amount of people that have reached out to Aubrey about going through their infertility struggles and, you know, struggling to have kids and, and then they've been able to have kids or just, they have hope that they are going to, because of Aubrey being vocal about, um, how long it took us to have Letty, um, things like that, I think is really, you know, a reminder of why we did social media and helps when you, feel like only negative or attacks are coming through social media sometimes to remember that there are people out there that you're helping, uh, you know, and some people aren't going to necessarily jive with you and, and what you have to say, you know, and that's okay. You know, if everyone liked the same thing, there'd only be one restaurant, there'd only be one style of clothes, you know, you know, we all like different things and, and no one's perfect. Um, and so some people can't accept your imperfections, so you don't have to accept their imperfections. Um, so I, I think that's just a reminder of why we do things is when people like that come to us and say, hey, you helped us lose weight or you've helped me through this hard time in my life. And uh, that's that's the coolest part about all this. I'm sure it uh, I'm sure it feels great to sell out a new cookie flavor, but I'm, I know the feeling of, you know, that experience in the grocery store, these messages hit on a whole nother level of just that impact. And at least from a fulfillment standpoint of just knowing that your life means something so much more than yourself. Now you're actually affecting other people that can then go affect others as well. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's nice to sell out cookies because then it's like obviously that's cash to either expand the business or, or you know, back into your pocket. But the truth is, like, we never started fat and weird for the money. I started fat and weird just because, like, I loved cookies and ice cream, and so I'm just like trying to share what I love with other people. So I think that um, that it can be a double edged sword. It hurts so much worse when someone doesn't like your cookies because you're like, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like dang, man, I really do love these cookies. Like, um, but at the same time, you know, not like I told you, not everyone's going to like the same things. And, and we built fat and weird because we want people to like come together and eat cookies together over 
you know, try these cookies, eat them, like create memories with family and friends. And, uh, you know, uh, it's working so far. I mean, a lot of people have done it. So let's go. I love it, man. I love it. I, I have to ask you about cookie fest. I know it was a big deal. It was a huge undertaking to, um, just execute that whole operation. I'm curious to hear your perspective on, you know, the whole thing and, and just the importance of like companies and brands doing in-person activations and bringing people together from a community standpoint, but also I'm sure you guys were able to market it and, and have a lot of fun on the business side. Yeah. I mean, I definitely learned a lot. I mean, that's an, that's an area that I can go on for days again about like learning a lot. Guinness is I would uh, have Guinness involved nearly as much as they were involved this time. Cause it was uh, essentially Guinness was like $80,000. Wow. So um, I don't know if it's my, I know that the internet's being weird right now. I don't know if it's mine or yours, so I'm sorry, but no, um, but uh, Guinness was a lot of money. Um, and then at the same time, just planning that big of an in-person outdoor event was a learning experience. Um, you know, Ashley um, Dreyer, uh, who does a lot of the summer shredding stuff for Christian now, um, she she was you know with Fat and Weird at that time to help plan the event. And I know she probably learned quite a bit about this because she was used to planning bodybuilding shows and this was quite a different beast. So there's numerous things I think you could ask anyone on our team uh, what you wish you could fix that didn't go right. Uh, and then there's things that probably went well above and beyond what we thought they would do and better than we thought they'd do. So, I mean, that's a hindsight with any situation that you can look back and say, well, these things went wrong. Um, but in general, I thought Cookie Fest was a huge success. We had a lot of fun. We got to meet a lot of great people. Um, but we are not doing it this year. I know that's a common question for people. Just because our focus right now is so much on wholesale, I couldn't take my eyes off of that to plan another event that size. I mean, Ashley was working for probably five, six months solely on Cookie Fest and logistics and people and, and everything that you needed to do for that. And we are just at a spot right now that I, I I can't take my eyes off of what we're doing to to make Cookie Fest happen. So maybe we can revisit Cookie Fest in uh, 2024. Um, but right now, uh, it's not going to be on the cards for this year. Yeah, no, man, I missed it. I missed it. I want to I want to come to the next one when you guys get everything sorted out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we definitely will do it again. And it'll be it'll be even better than it was in uh, 2022. It was a blast. And I, I definitely think it's a but that's another moment where you probably for, from social media, you look at that and be like, man, that must have been the greatest day ever. It was a it was a very stressful day. Awesome. It was, uh, you know, it was just a lot of moving parts. Um, and I think that sometimes those big events, like you get to enjoy more as a spectator than the people like putting them on, you know, know. like, so that's the the hard part of that, you know, so. Yeah, totally makes sense, man. That's awesome. Well, I want to shift gears a bit. This is something we kind of chatted about quickly before we started recording, but you're now a father and that's something that's obviously very important to you. You take pride in being a father and leading your your daughter and your family. How has that kind of impacted your personal life, your fitness, your business, and and kind of what does that look like on a day-to-day? -day? Yeah, I mean, I literally think it's like a, a switch that flips like as soon as you're your kid is born. Um, and you know, I, I don't want to speak for everyone because I think everyone's different, but for me personally, everything else became so much less important. Um, like I used to work out five, six days a week, um, be in the gym for an hour and a half. It was like also my social time. So I'm always in the gym a little bit longer than you need to be. Um, but now I'm in the gym like three to four times a week. Uh, I just want to be healthy, you know, for like a longer life to spend more time with my family than, than I care about like looking a certain way. I think you, you know, you really do like, you know, flip this switch. I, I immediately, I don't know, immediately felt like I didn't love, show enough love and appreciation to my parents as soon as my daughter was born. Cause I was like, dang, if they feel this way about me right now, I'm a little <laughs> shit, you know? Um, so, but like, that's, that flipped. Another switch just flipped is just like, you know, used to, I would like bury myself in work. I'd work until eight, nine o'clock at night. And like, now I, I will take a break from five to seven while she's still awake to do bedtime, dinner time, like all that stuff. And I'll go back to work if I have to, but like, I don't know, it's just not as important to me anymore. Like if I financially were in, I guess financially, why does it even matter? Cause I just described some of the worst times in my parents' financial lives as some of the best times in my life because they were present and that they were there for us. So I think that you just like really understand that like 
who cares about money as long as you have enough money to live, you know? And, um, I don't know. I, I don't look back at any of my childhood with any kind of animosity. And we were definitely in the low, low of the income of, you know, people. Uh, but we had a roof over our heads. We had power most of the times and water uh, and we had food, you know, and whether it was McDonald's cheeseburgers or something we were, ha we were going to eat. And I think that uh, I just really learned that what's important was that my parents were there and that yeah. they were a part of my life. And so, yeah, I think a lot of stuff just just changes for you. You, you realize like what's actually important to you. And obviously I, I like want to be successful because I want to make sure that, you know, Scarlett doesn't have to worry about things that I had to worry about later in life when I could kind of see now that my parents were struggling financially, you know, but I, um, in the end of it all, I think the truth is like, I just want to be present and want to soak up those mem memories and moments with her because you don't get those back, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's good. Yeah. One, one thing you guys do consistently I've seen that I love is y'all pray as a family. And now I've seen y'all post where she's even wanting to pray more, which is so cool. <laughs> yeah. So we, so we used to eat dinner together, like at the, uh, kitchen island and she had like a little booster seat but she hates being in the booster seat she wants to sit like in a real chair with everyone else and so then she kept trying to sit in our laps and that's very hard to eat with a kid sitting in your lap so when we got her that little table for christmas so it's only been a couple of weeks now we were like hey let's just sit at the little table with her <laughs> and that's when it really started and we started praying before dinner and she loves it now and she um you know i, I know she doesn't really know what's going on but she closed her eyes and at the end of it she she yelled her little amen and uh um you know someone messaged me and they said hey i'm not really religious but i really think this is cute and i think at the end of the day i'm not trying to to force a decision on her whether she wants to believe in god or wants to be a christian but i do want to instill those values into her about love and respect and things like that and I, you know i feel like uh, a lot of people give christianity a bad rap based on their stances on certain um social issues and things like that but um you know aubrey and i are a little bit different i guess like i truly believe a lot of that stuff is between you and god and i'm gonna love you as long as you're not doing something to like attack me and my family um you know and so you know i've had a lot of discussions with friends on social media about this kind of stuff and you know, I just want to make sure that Letty is respectful, is loving, is kind, treats other people well, and then her relationship with God will hopefully follow after that, but it's up to her, so. Yeah, no, I love that. And then you're, you're leading in a positive way. I think that's all that really matters. And uh, yeah, she's going to be really grateful to have that kind of parent, uh, parenthood and that kind of leadership. I know she will be, so that's exciting. Yeah, well, Hopefully she looks back on it with fond memories, you know, <laughs> I think that's the biggest thing as a parent, like you, there's like no book for this, right? You know, you have gentle parenting, you have, um, you know, <laughs> there's all these different parenting techniques out there. And, and uh, then you have people talking, you know, on, on social media about how they have trauma from the way their parents raised them. And you have a kid and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to mess this up. And I think that's probably the biggest stressor as a parent is like, you feel like, everything you do, like, are you going to mess your kid up for life? Are you going to instill some kind of trauma in them? You have, you are not a perfect person. So you're just trying to do your best. And, and I, I think that's just, that's truly the hardest part. And, and then obviously social media makes things a lot harder because people will judge you. Um, re regardless of you being a parent, social media truly makes your life a lot more difficult. You, you compare your life to other people's, you know, and, and you see other people doing something and you feel like you're not doing as good. And, um, yeah, social media is hard. It's, it's, it's been a blessing to give us the stuff that's given us, but it takes a lot too. So for sure. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't see when they, they may, um, aspire to have that following or that platform. They don't see all the things that you have to be careful of or the, you know, the things you go through mentally, just being like, man, if I put this out and I get, you know, there's just a lot more like that comes with the territory. I think that people don't necessarily realize. Well, even even from just not even posting on social media, but consuming social media, um, one of my favorite quotes is comparison is the thief of joy. And a lot of people find themselves comparing other people's lives like, oh, wow, this person goes on more vacations than me. This person has more money than me. This person has 
you know, maybe you're single. This person has a pretty significant other. Uh, this person has a kid and I really want a kid. Like this person has the things that I want. And um, the difficult part about that is like, it's not an all encompassing picture of that person's life. Um, you know, I, I have friends that are very, very, very wealthy, like in the top 0.001%, right? But are struggling mentally or have lost someone very close to them. And they would have given up all that money to have that person back. And so it's really, really hard because you'll look at that and be like, man, I wish I had their life. And they're like, man, I, I would give up my entire life just to have this one aspect of your life. Right. And yeah. so again, it's all perspective on things. You know, if you see someone going on vacation all the time, you may think, dang, I wish I had as much money as them. Because in your mind, you would say, I need this much money to be going on that many vacations, but they may have no money at all. They may spend every dime they have on vacation. In fact, they may be in like credit card debt going on these vacations, but you don't see that. You just see what they show on social media and you fill in the rest of their life with what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time you, you fill it in with your beliefs, right? So I would need to be making $500,000 a year to be going on the vacations they're going on. I don't even feel like they do that much work. How are they making $500,000 a year? I'm jealous of their life. Well, they're merely making $50,000 a year, but they're literally, you know, living at home still, or they're spending all their money on vacations or, you know, so there's just a lot of different uh, areas that, you know, we, we take the 1% that we see and then we fill everything else in and that's not the true picture. And so, you got to remember a lot of times you're creating the the picture and then you're getting upset about that picture that you created, you know? So that's, true. that's a good way to look at it, man. That's, that's pretty deep. That's wise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, my big thing now is like, I've read a lot of leadership books, but I'm reading a lot of books on just like psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy and like why we think the way we think and how that leads into anxiety and depression. And I, you know, it's social media is a large culprit of those things. Um, in fact, I, I would say that if I didn't have businesses and a brand built on social media, I would delete social media. Wow. So Man, that's powerful. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I agree. I think it's tough. And obviously the world we live in now with e-commerce and selling products online, it's like, it's obviously it's obviously it has to be there. Like you have to have that presence, but it does complicate things. And it, it is crazy to think there are some people out there that don't exist on social media. And just to think of maybe the peace that they have at times. <laughs> yeah. I, do, I have friends that have deleted it completely. And they talk about how they don't have any more anxiety. They don't have um, depression anymore. And they're just so much more content. And, and I think you're a lot more present. I mean, how many times do you sure. find yourself opening up social media to scroll while you're with a friends or your family and you're not present in the conversation anymore because you're consuming content, you know, and these people that are around you are the ones that care about you. I think before we even started, I told you this, that why wouldn't you want to spend time with the people that once you pass away are, are still going to care about you. The yeah. people that you're scrolling through and, you know, liking their videos on social media may not even know you exist. And I can, and when you pass away, they're not going to think anything of it, but the people sitting at that table with you are the ones going to be going to your funeral and to be mourning the loss of you. Um, and so that's just one of those things, you know, that you really, perspective on life but no it's, it's kind really of morbid true. sorry <laughs> no it's, it's on I mean sometimes I think it's good to kind of just bring that to the surface and, and let people chew on that because it's so true and I I catch myself doing it too obviously with what I do work-wise like I, I have to spend a lot of a lot of time on social media doing a lot of outreach meeting people connecting and but at the end of the day like to your point you got to spend that intentional time with people and it's so crazy I was at the gym last night and I'm like looking around and I'm like man the percentage of people that are just looking at their phone between sets are like, it's just like you're in a public social setting or really anywhere grocery stores, you go anywhere, you look around, people are on their device, which is, it's just kind of, it's, it's interesting if you really kind of take it in, you know, it's, I think we've gotten used to it as a society, but like, if you really sit there and like unpack what's happening, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And you see that big shift and it's people have shifted away from that yeah. like personal connection to a digital connection. So um, you know, I mean, I, like I said, there's, there's plenty of pros that come with social media. A lot of things that uh, our life would not be the way it was with that, without social media. Um, but at the same time, you got to figure out, are you the master or are you the slave? So it's good, man. 
Let's go, dude. I really appreciate you doing this episode. This has been really fun, very insightful. And honestly, I've learned a lot from you and, and your experiences. The last kind of thing I wanted to hit on and hear from you specifically is what is your day to day look like? I'm sure there's probably some, you know, differences in, in what that looks like. And then also, what's your current training style? And how do you incorporate that fitness into your life? I know you touched on it briefly, you know, saying it you kind of scaled back some, but I would love to kind of hear what that looks like. Yeah, so day to day, I wish I had a routine. It, it's more about like, uh, putting out fires, I feel like constantly, you know, around here, a lot of it's like planning for the future. You know, I'm, I'm I have a lot of emails open over over here, like on the other computer screen about meeting with manufacturers of uh, like different equipment um, for our expansion onto a, we have another 2500 square feet. So we're building 7500 right now and the 2500 is being added on and, and it should be done in like the next week or so like it's already drywalled and sheetrocked and and everything's done, it really, it's just like painting and minor stuff. And then we have to cut a hole through from that side to the other side so the buildings connect. But um, so a lot of it's been doing dealing with stuff like that, um, hiring new employees, because we're going into wholesale, our volume is going to go up sourcing new equipment, um, building out um, our SQF program, which is called uh, safe quality foods, which if you are a a manufacturer that wants to be in wholesale it's like another step above just having a food permit so just to sell to you i only have to have like a food permit but to sell to publics i have to have this extra certification so building wow. out that program so it's just like i mean like when you emailed me about scheduling a time i'm like these days are good because i'll just like push things around because there's nothing that's really said i just have to go downstairs get like get working on these things cool. um but yeah, it's just, it's kind of just like a little bit of a controlled chaos on the day to day. And then for training wise, when Letty goes to preschool, it's at seven 30 in the morning. So normally I drop her off at seven 30 and then I'd go to the gym right afterwards so that I can get done. The later in the day it becomes the less likely I'm going to be able to work out just because of, you know, life popping up and, sure. you know, things coming up. So I, I had to make it a morning routine to be able to get it done. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I had this like grand routine where I woke up and I did X, Y, Z, and then I did this, it, I wake up in the morning and I figure out what's going to have to happen for the day. So, yeah. And how do you, how do you specifically train right now? Your, your background was kind of in bodybuilding, right? But you've, yeah, I still, I just live full, but I do full body and I switched over to full body probably like almost three years ago now. And it was because I was missing so much time in the gym with just like business and stuff that I felt like I was like, Oh, no, I missed leg day, I need to make this up. Oh, I missed back day, I need to make this up. So I went to full body. And that way, it was like, no matter what, even if I only go to the gym, like twice in a week, like I've hit every body part twice. And that's mm -hmm. decent. And then if I go three times a week, I've hit every body part three times, which would be, I mean, that's, that's pretty good, right? I've done, sure. you know, nine sets for a body part. Like that's, that's great. Um, so that's kind of like why I've switched to full body. Normally, it, uh, it could take longer, but a lot of times I'll superset antagonist muscles. So, you know, if I'm doing quads, I don't necessarily do, I'll do like biceps or some kind of muscle that's not like fatiguing. Like I, I wouldn't do like quads and back together or quads and chest together just because like a lot that can be just a really heavy on your cardiovascular system as well as your central nervous system. But sure. I'll superset together like, okay, I just finished back. Now let's do, um, you know, triceps and then I'll do quads and hamstrings together sometimes or, and, and superset antagonist muscles so I can be out of there if I have to be in like 40 minutes with a full body workout. But generally, if I could take my time about an hour and 15 minutes is what I do working out. So let's go, man. Well, dude, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're super busy and I really, really do appreciate your time. And I think everyone listening to this is going to be really grateful as well for, for all the different value that you brought to this episode. Yeah, so everyone needs to go order cookies now from fatweirdcookie.com, you know. I like it. <laughs> yeah, grab grab some cookies uh and then you can uh, you can find me, my wife and um my wife's coaching business. Uh if you go to Fat and Weird Cookie, it's only following three people. It's me, my wife and my wife's coaching business, so that's the easiest thing to do. Find Fat and Weird Cookie and then you can find everything else. I love it, man. I love it. People will definitely need to go check out the cookies, but Brad, thank you so much, man. I hope you have an amazing rest of the week and I really appreciate you doing this episode. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.